Good morning, and thank you for joining Year of Agility, the post-ish COVID consumer ahead of the holiday curve with Tierney Wilson, SVP Client Strategy, January Digital, Christina Gustafson, SVP Content, Shop Talk, Carolyn Masulo, VP Head of Ecom Marketing, Peapod Digital. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the conversation, to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Now here's your host, Deborah Winesweg, CEO and founder of Coresight Research. Thanks, Drew. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I think this is a really interesting topic because as we read in the press, we've heard about the next normal, the new normal, whatever normal people want it to be. But I think the new normal in retail is that there is no longer a normal. And who can remember what normal was anyways? And so I think that the conclusion, the logical one, is that we, we need an agile and flexible approach to preparing for an ever-changing consumer as we ease into the post-ish COVID economy and really geared for the holiday season. You know, hence as the you know, kind of image here says, right, this, this idea around this year of agility. And so today we wanna to talk about what agility and flexibility mean and how you know, very specifically retailers should be preparing for the holiday season to set themselves up for, for this year and beyond. And so some of the topics we're going to cover today where brands must shift their focus in order to be successful during the holidays, how successful organizations are restructuring to be agile, and what experience and engagement you know, consumers are expecting today and in the months ahead, and how can this drive you know, kind of consumer acquisition and retention? Here are some reports we've written recently on these topics. And then we are so honored to have such an esteemed group of panelists join us today. Uh, so we've got Tierney, Caroline, and Christina. Uh, I think most of you know Christina from Shop Talk and Caroline and Tierney just have a wealth of information. So there is a lot to get through. We will share the, the slides after the webinar. And even more of a treat is Corsite and January Digital have recently come out with an in-depth report on this year of agility. Uh, we will share that link as well. And we're going to start a poll. So all kinds of things coming at you. And what we're going to do is, is really start to define and imagine what this, this year of agility is and, and how it's defined. And so Tierney, I was wondering if we could kick off with you. I mean, where do things stand in the retail sector right now and, and how should we frame this? Yeah, I think the, the retail sector has been turned on its head in a lot of ways. There's been so many um, iterations of what has happened over the past year as consumers have kind of had lights at the end of the tunnel and then gone back into um, situations where we're in lockdown. And so I think for businesses and brands coming out of the past year, what's so important is focusing on taking the convenience you've had in uh, 2020 and 2021 that you've added to your business and making sure you're carrying that through to 2021 um, into holiday and into 2022. And I think more than anything, um, consumers expect that businesses will no longer just be the e-com and brick and mortar, but the they are going to get a 100% omni-channel experience regardless of where they're shopping. No, I think it's that that's so, you know, kind of consistent with with what we've been focusing on at Coresight, which is also it's like right, it's just retail, right? We don't need to necessarily think about channels, right? Consumers just want this product and they want it seamlessly and, and in a frictionless way. And so we're, we're seeing so much of that, you know, kind of drive what consumers are prioritizing. You know, Tierney, as, as you're seeing consumers shop and engage what is it that, that's top priority for them? I think convenience more than anything. Um, I think that's driving, I know for myself as a consumer, that drives why I make purchases when I make purchases. Is it convenient for me to do so? Um, I think that's the, been one of the kind of biggest takeaways of the past year and will continue. We've gotten used to things being convenient, whether we buy them in store or online. And I think retailers need to expect that to continue. And, and along those lines, Christina, you know, what do you think we can expect from this, you know, kind of agile, you know, kind of consumer and retailers, they work together. What do you think that looks like for the rest of 21 and into 22? And, and what do we, you know, what do we as analysts need to think about? And what do the retailers need to consider? 
Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and Deborah, I would actually point to one of the stats from this report that we're talking through today from January Digital. I think it's probably no surprise to anyone out there that consumers are going to be shifting their spend over to experiences, dining out, domestic travel, um, things like that. I believe the number was 42% um, of consumers specifically with incomes of 100k plus um, plan to increase their spending on those categories. But I think, you know, that's a very easy sort of cop out um, for retailers to say, oh, well, hey, you know, we're coming out of this pandemic everyone wants to travel and no one's going to want to buy things anymore. But I, I think that can't be farther from the truth that I actually probably think consumers are underestimating how much catching up they have to do on their wardrobes as they get back to dining out to travel. I know myself, I haven't had a wardrobe refresh in about a year and a half and went to meet friends last weekend and was like, oh, I, I guess I can't wear these, um, these red yoga pants out in public anymore. So I think it's a huge opportunity um, for retailers to sort of play into some of the macro spending trends um, and use them to their advantage. I think the other thing that I would call out is just that there is going to be an increase in consumer mobility going forward. Not to say that work from home isn't going to be a permanent part of many people's lives, um, whether it's a partial return to the office, um, working from home several days a week, but as the economy does open up and people are in their cars more often, um, whether it is going to work, whether it's just picking up Starbucks, going to a soccer game, I think that's going to shift consumer behavior. And while we might see a little bit of a decrease um, initially in things like buy online, pick up in store, um, as those consumer behaviors um, shift back again to your point toward what they were considered to be normal previously, um, I think that's going to continue to be a huge value add um, for consumers going forward. So retailers just really leaning into some of those convenience plays um, to Kearney's point, uh, to Tierney's point rather, um, and making sure that they're just continuing to improve on, on those products. And right, and consumers, everyone, I, you know, defines convenience differently as well. And I think we, we will see kind of what that, that means to people. And also, Christine, I think you bring up another really good point. And the data suggests, right, where you know many of us had expected, you know, kind of beauty sales to be through the roof, because you know we we had been wearing masks and and whatnot. They they've been just a fraction of of the growth of what we've seen in apparel. To your point, and then I think also there had been this belief that we were going to see this this massive pullback in grocery, especially you know kind of e-grocery, and that's been anything farther from the truth. So. I think that you know uh, I, I like to go in with a thesis and then you know kind of find supporting data that uh, that we trust and, and I think there's so much here today that you know we want to unpack. Now, Caroline, in, in light of demanding consumer expectations and rapidly shifting behaviors, you know how do you think retailers should think about becoming more agile? Sure. So um, grocery is of course a super competitive category, and what a wild time. Uh, to be in the, the grocery category amidst a pandemic. Um, but the way our team was thinking about it is it was essential to have a multi-layered approach. So we would talk a lot about how we can't be dedicated to one piece of our omni-channel strategy at any given time. We think about really we're always on optimizing our customer value proposition, delivering the convenience, both in brick and mortar and e-com as Tierney talked about. But all of that at the same time that we're trying to deliver our most efficient go-to-market strategy as kind of that evergreen approach to continuing to drive awareness while we continue to kind of evolve our offering at a very rapid pace based on what we're seeing in our environment and grocery. So we uh, actually have many questions coming in in terms of uh, food specifically. So I'm, I'm going to use this opportunity, Caroline, to follow up with a question from the audience. So. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much. Um, how will food purchase consumption and meal preparation be impacted in your opinion? Yeah, you know, I think one of the really beautiful things that happened during the pandemic was we saw a lot of people obviously spending more time in their kitchen and doing their own meal preparation, doing a lot of discovery. I think our category has really benefited from the fact that we have very highly localized brands that have really kind of great community connection. I think we're going to continue to see that um, evolve as people have become much more kind of conscious of um, what's going on in their kitchen. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited um, to see, see that. And then, you know, one, one additional kind of follow up in terms of, you know, as, as we look at the kind of shopping behaviors, you know, the, there is some kind of thought process from our from our audience in terms of consumers looking for for familiarity of brands and and how Caroline do you think that that drives their their purchase intent or shopping behavior? Um, 
Sure. So if I understand um, the question, something that um, is critical, at least within our businesses, is really working to have kind of same products in store as we do online and creating experiences. Obviously, they're, they're very tactically different being in a brick and mortar um, versus e-com, but creating experiences that not only are familiar, but again, driving that discovery. Because I think a lot of people, as we kind of move into this ish time, you're going to see people want to have that experience of being in the aisle and discovering new products that you know uh, they weren't aware of and touching and feeling. And so how can we continue to think about how we bring that into the e-com space? That's something that uh, um, my team really enjoys, enjoys thinking about because yes, um, you want to see the familiar things and those, those will be there, but that discovery piece is something that has really blossomed um, for, for our company during the pandemic. Well, and in, in grocery, right, between online and offline, that discovery process is, you know, is unique in both channels. And then, right, this this growth in kind of retail media that we've seen as a result, like specifically in grocery, I think it is the most interesting in terms of consumer behavioral changes and the ability to to introduce new products. And it's also, right, with the lack of R&D, um, I, I just, I think that there's so much potential and, you know, we're just kind of getting started from a technology perspective. Christina, what does this idea of agility mean to you? And, and how do you think that's changed since, you know, let's call it March of 2020? And, and what does that word mean to you going forward? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I think I would define it through different phases. Um, I think when you think about pre-pandemic, you think about agility names that would come to mind are companies like Amazon, companies like Walmart, where they're not afraid to roll out a product that isn't absolutely perfect, send it to the market, see how consumers are reacting, get direct feedback, iterate, continue rolling it out. You know, I think those were two hallmarks of those companies. As I think through the pandemic, that agility mentality had to be adopted, right? You know, we were seeing it from traditional brands and retailers simply because they did not have a choice. They had to do this, especially if they were in, um, you know, uh, grocery category uh, to Caroline's point. Um, you know, it really just sort of became a method of survival. And so then I think about agility looking forward as a continuation of that mentality, I think it's very easy to fall back into your old habits when you're not in crisis mode anymore. And so the folks who are out there and continue to iterate, who continue to push, who aren't worried about getting negative feedback from customers, negative feedback from Wall Street or whomever it might be um, as they are experimenting with things and just say, hey, you know what, even though this isn't a necessity anymore, this is how we need to do our business. Um, those are gonna be the folks I think that, that thrive throughout the rest of the year and through 2022. And Christina, just because you know, I, I know that we've had some of these conversations around last mile and frictionless, seamlessness. We, we've gotten quite a few questions from the audience, and I think Bill kind of summarized it the best and just very straightforward is like, how will the cost and capacity constraints in the last, last mile impact the holiday season, and, and what can we do to abate that? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would just say plan ahead. I mean, it, it seems obvious, but I think for so many months, actually, but a year, um, retailers have been trained to be very conservative with their thinking because things dramatically shifted. They got very bad very quickly, but I would almost argue that they're getting good almost as quickly as they got bad. Um, I just think that the rate of recovery has been something that probably a lot of people did not expect to see. I know that I'm down here in Atlanta and you would probably think the pandemic never even existed. Um, bars and restaurants are full, uh, retail stores are full and it's only what, May? Um, so flash forward, think about October, November, if the mentality is already there, it's gonna be there even more so when December comes, especially when you factor in the fact that consumers didn't have a traditional holiday season last year. So the demand is gonna be there. I think the supply constraints are gonna to continue to, to be there. We're already seeing shortages and everything from what catch up labor, gas, everything, you name it, there's shortages. So I think, you know, lean in to the orders um, and, and plan ahead, plan early. It, yeah. it is, well, look at what happened with Mother's Day, right? In terms of just this, the sales volume in, in absolutely every channel. And so I, I, I think that the, this idea around, so, so we talked to somebody at the Fed and they said what we've seen, what they thought was going to take six months, we've seen in two weeks. So think about that from, you know, a retailer perspective and, you know, not only the volumes that they're, you know, the great news that are coming in. So they have, you know, kind of more, if you will, slack in the system to, to spend on technology, et cetera, but even just being able to handle that. And so, you know, Tierney, I'm going to cue this up for you. I mean, as we think about all this change, you know, what are you seeing kind of as the three areas where retailers like must prioritize agility this year? And, and why is that? 
Yeah, I think the one of those, as Christina kind of was talking to, pertaining to the to um, shortages on the supply chain side, is retailers have to know that it is coming. The demand is coming and has to be able to have multiple plans for how they can meet that demand. Um, and so I think one of the key things that, that retailers need to really be focusing on now, not waiting till September, October, um, is you know how they can be feasible on reacting to supply chain disruptions. What are plans to be able to do that? Um, what are, you know, backup initiatives that you can have internally so that should something go wrong, there's a plan B. And while the plan B might not be as good as the plan A, it's still a plan that can be executed and can keep your business moving forward. I think that's the, that's one of the key areas we would recommend focusing. I think the other two are, um, you know, on how can you continue to make um, returns easy for customers. I think viewing customer acquisition as just the first purchase or um, the purchase is such a short-sighted way um, to look at engaging in relationships with customers. So how are you using all of the um, touch points you have within your business um, to make returns easy for customers and know that they can come and return something and potentially buy something else? I think there's as we've seen, you know, Amazon turning um, fulfillment centers into return sites and um, stores, you know, having set areas within their their storefront for returns. I think that becomes something that's so important as we move from this, you know, buying only online to back in store and going back and forth between the two. Um, and I think, you know, the last thing I would say is just going back to what Caroline said about how some customers expect to have the same assortment online in store having that you know real omni-channel um purchase options for customers is super important from the from some of the research um with you guys we found that you know a third of customers expected the ability to purchase same products in store and online to be one of the most important things for them. And so I think retailers taking that seriously, working now to be able to pivot on all of those things is important. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And we got a great question actually from Craig along those lines that I'm gonna tee up for, for Caroline. So he says, you spoke to the thrill of discovery becoming a key shopping moment. Do you think about creating, I thought this was interesting, deliberate friction to enable those moments and is it only in store? Um. No, it's definitely not only in store. And I would say, um, or potentially I would answer it, the disruptive friction is more, the more content and kind of editorial around our recipes and our new products and our suppliers, like giving more information to allow the discovery in a different way, which comes to life in e-commerce than it does an in-store is actually like people are spending the time to learn more, read through how to make things, what the best products are, and then try them um, and, and, you know, have them at home in terms of uh, cooking for themselves versus like when they're in store, it's, um, we find people's transactions are a bit you know, quicker. Um, and when they're buying their routinized products, they're not necessarily flipping them over, reading the stories and things like that, um, because they're obviously in public um, with a lot of other people shopping around them. That makes a ton of sense. And, and I think that, you know, Christina, one, one thing to, to focus on this slide is just, you know, what, are, what do you think we're seeing in terms of this, this yearning um, to return to spending on experiences, services, and discretionary? And how do you think that plays out longer term? I mean, I don't think it's going away. I think there's just so much pent up demand, whether it's, you know, traveling. I One thing that I noted um, when I was first taking a look at this slide is leisure domestic travel is at the top of the list. Makes a lot of sense for right now, but um, I can bet you as soon as the borders open up, people are gonna be thinking about longer term trips that they can be taking, um, new geographies, new locations that they can explore um, and things like that. But, you know, I, I don't necessarily see this desire um, abating for, for any, 
significant amount of time. Um, one thing I know that Tierney and I were speaking about before this call is just that there has also been a shift toward the in-home entertainment, um, and I think that will continue. Um, so I think you will continue to see some spend in that capacity, especially after people have spent a whole year um, investing in their homes, investing in their entertainment spaces. We saw in um, Home Depot earnings um, what last week that that trend hasn't abated in any capacity. So I think we're going to see a continuation um, of some of that at-home um, celebratory spend as well. Um, but again, I would just say, you know, I, I don't suspect that the slowdown in apparel will either come uh, will come soon either. Um, and I think about it just in terms of seasonality, right? We're just hitting summer. So here's your summer wardrobe refresh. I think about it with fall. Here's your fall wardrobe. Like we missed out on so many things over the past year. It's not just going to be a one and done where, okay, I've done my shopping and, and we're all set. Well, it's, it's the refresh. It's also the, you know, the special occasions and then just the, you know, we did see from a design perspective, right? A lot of innovation from, from retail. And so I think there's, there's innovation that's that's coming from that perspective and it's it's faster than it than it used to be. And so I think that's what's quite interesting. You know, as we look at uh Tierney, what ex, you know, what experience and engagement do customers expect from you know brands today and also in the months ahead? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, I think it's it's we've talked a lot about discovery um a little bit, but I think consumers still expect surprise and delights. I think we we love brands because brands entertain us. Um, and, and I think consumers expect that now more than ever, right? We are in such a uh, mindset where we want to be entertained. We're excited to get back out. And I think brands need to keep that in mind. So having, a, a um, keeping the fun at the heart of, of a brand, I think is important in the next six months, especially, I think also, you know, there's been some amazing, um, shifts in how we engage with different, uh, with brands. And I think a, a perfect example is um, live streaming. Like a year and a half ago, we never would have thought that live streaming would be as big as it is from a commerce perspective. Um, but I think brands thinking of it just as a commerce perspective uh, moving forward is short-sighted. I think it's a, it's a way to engage and entertain your customers. Um, and so I think things like live streaming will stick around. Um, they might not be exactly how we're using them today, um, but I think they're here to stay. So I think brands, it goes back to what are the things we've learned from the past year? How can we not just forget them and put them in the trash, but rather continue to bring them to life for customers um, as we are in this, you know, next transition phase of being at home, but also re-engaging with friends and society and work and um, outside of the home. I mean, you bring up the on the live streaming side where, where we, of course, I'd spent a lot of time there, not only in the, the U.S., but in other geographies as well. And to me, one of the most interesting areas as it relates really to Caroline is we, we've seen a ton right where the, the farmers are themselves becoming KOLs, right? A key opinion leader and influencer. And so the idea that you can actually, in some ways, almost brand an orange or a chicken or, or other kind of fresh product, and it's not only giving the, these farmers, right, like a personality, but it's starting to change the way that we think about, in some ways, buying the most basic products and bringing them, them to life. I mean, Caroline, how have you thought about live streaming in, in your business? And, you know, kind of where do you think the opportunities are to think differently about how you engage with customers? Yeah, I think anytime you can put um, a face and an emotion behind something that, you know, people are putting in their bodies, which for us, you know, the food and the wellness, that's something that became obviously even more important to people during COVID. So continuing to kind of give access to the information behind where the food is coming from, those are stories that we're gonna have to continue to tell. And, um, you know, our company definitely has an eye towards supplier diversity, which is also important to our consumers. A lot of work around sustainability and intertwining those stories as well. Um, that's definitely something that in terms of utilizing a lot of our kind of new digital channels um, that, you know, us in a more traditional um, category previously, we're definitely kind of pushing into um, that kind of information dissemination. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you, you basically already had your year, your agility, you're on kind of like year two now. And I, <laughs> and, and, and I mean, what can, can you, you know, can you just talk a little bit about what, what that experience was like since, right, grocery never closed. So you were open, right? It was like you were changing the wheels of the bus as it was running. 
what did you learn from that? And as, as you think ahead, how does that change you think differently about being agile? Sure. So this definitely was, um, you know, non, non PDL specific, but the category, what was really, um, personally um, disruptive was when the pandemic started, we went from, you know, being able to execute and optimize our like omni-channel marketing strategies on a daily basis to boom, like we had to turn off marketing because we were exacerbating the the outages and the lines and the problem. And we're trying to figure out exactly what we're supposed to communicate. So it was an interesting time because the whole category essentially went dark. Um, and then it was a phased approach of, um, you know, the right thing to say at the right time once supply chain and operations was in a good spot. But then you had some excess dollars. And so what was your strategy coming out of the pandemic um, and potentially looking at different marketing channels that we hadn't necessarily explored due to, you know, spend, but it was like, it was a completely, di- I had never in my life been told turn off marketing. <laughs> I'm always looking for more dollars. Um, so I think that was, that was certainly the most interesting um, piece for, for us specifically. I think you know, looking at this slide right here, this is also something that is interesting and Tierney was talking about it. As we think about convenience and the grocery category specifically, I mean, we saw, you know, the large marketplaces like the Amazons of the world move into grocery. Um, and now grocery is moving into marketplace. So thinking through, you know, how we can offer a more kind of holistic um, offering and how we communicate that appropriately. And we pick, hand pick kind of our suppliers and our vendors um, that make sense for each of our local brands. I mean, that's a completely new strategy that we had time to think through during the pandemic. And now we're going to be, be bringing to market. So well, it's I, very I, different for the grocery category. I, I get very excited about this because I, I think that what we've seen is right. Consumers are changing how they think about health and and also beauty, right? It's from like the inside out. And so the the opportunity for, you know, the consumer trusts you innately, right? Because they're buying their groceries from you, which they're ingesting. And so the opportunity to do more, more with them and for them, and, and they want the simplicity. I mean, we talked about right through the, the data that we've seen here, right? This, this idea around kind of uh, simplicity. And so I, I, I think that, you know, as we look at this, Christina, and, and we think about the changes in customer behavior, who do you think, and, and it's funny, I've, I've actually heard uh, multiple times in the last week, right? There's going to be no more retailer bankruptcies because there's so much demand for product. <laughs> so, so with that in mind, right, how do retailers work together? How do they support each other? And, you know, how do they kind of enable the best outcomes for themselves and for customers? Yeah, I, I wish that were the case, Deborah. I feel like that's a, an outlook I would love to have. I think it's very, you know, easy to, to take a step back and say, you know, demand is back. That doesn't necessarily mean demand for everything is going to be back. I think at the end of the day, if you're not buying the right product, consumers aren't going to buy it and they can have as much money in their pockets as they want, but they're probably not going to spend it with you. Um, I think some of the interesting things that we've seen over the past year that I, that I hope we continue to see in terms of retailers supporting one another is um, sharing best practices. I actually thought it was really fantastic when I believe it was Kroger came out with their best practices for in-store grocery safety. Um, you know, here's what we've learned. Here's a manual for everyone else who's who's fighting through these times. And, and I would love for personally, to see more of that um, collaboration going forward. I think also just in terms of some of the unique partnerships that we've seen um, with some of the um, larger stores teaming up with some of the beauty chains um, as well, um, really interesting synergies there and, and potential to um, tap into both customer bases um, in a way that will benefit um, you know, all the parties that are involved. So um, I think from that perspective, it's been really fun to see some of the larger players working together. I think before the pandemic, you were starting to see um, the larger players open up to working with some of the startups, You know, whether it was yeah. some of the the um, CPG brands, bringing them onto the shelves and things like that. But um, it'll be interesting to see if this sort of um, working together in partnership continues um, through 22. So, Jeremy, we've got a lot of questions on marketing and spend. Uh, this one is from Sally. Uh, where should my ad dollars go for the rest of the year? It's a multi-part question, but let's start there. Great question. Um, I think what I would say is um, it's super important that your uh, ad dollars are going to tailoring your messaging to who you have brought in over the past year, how you are retaining them, 
as you um, kind of move through the rest of the year and prepare for holiday. Um, but also making sure you're personalizing messaging to any new customers. And so I think what we're seeing more than ever is that it's super important that you be using the data you do have in all of your marketing. So if you are not prioritizing your first party data, um, I would recommend that you do that now um, and take a hard look at where are, where are your customers focused? Where are they interested? What is the tailored messaging they wanna receive from you? And how do you curate that specific to them? I think the other place too, we've seen um, you know, channels like connected TV and digital audio um, become so much more important on media plans in the past year. And I think that will um, continue to be the case the messaging will be different. So it's super important, again, that you um, shift your messaging and you have the agility to be able to do that. Um, the other thing I would say too, is that what we're, we're seeing is businesses that have, um, what we're, you know, we're calling stair-step plans, the ability to quickly get in to um, the next channel or the ability to quickly pivot into the next plan if you're seeing success is super important. So the days of kind of having one plan where you execute it month after month for the next six months um, are long behind us. I think that's where agility in terms of where you're putting marketing dollars is more important than ever. And I think Caroline spoke to, you know, what happened in March last year versus May versus August to where we are now is so different. And I think everybody should expect that to continue. Um, what happens in August versus now or where consumers are in December are gonna be different places. And it's super important you have those stair set plans um, so that you can quickly pivot into them. Yeah, I, I think it's really helpful oftentimes, right? You know, we, we all like frameworks and we like to know kind of how to focus within these frameworks. And so, you know, we've, we've gotten a few questions and, and like I said, this is a multi-part, but I'll, I'll just ask the next part and then we can follow up with the um, person afterwards. But what percent of it, what percentage of annual revenue should retailers consider for marketing? And then how should they track their ad or social media spend? Maybe that's a little bit more tactical, but it, it seems like it's really critical. Yeah, I'll answer the, the question on percentage of sales um, that, that should be spent on marketing dollars. Obviously, every organization is unique um, and kind of the structure of every organization is going to be slightly different. But the general rule of thumb that we always kind of utilize is um, if you're in a growth mode and you have the ability to be in a growth mode, you should be flexing up your spend to grab the marketplace while you can. And so, um, you know, at those moments, you might be thinking spend between eight or, you know, 12 percent um, of, of total sales on marketing. Um, at other times, you might need to totally pull it back. Um, if you're, you know, not in a super hyper focused growth mode. Um, and so in those times you might, you know, drop down to a seven, six, seven percent spend. Um, but it depends on where the organization is and what their goals are um, in that time. So again, I think you have to be able to have those stair step plans where you, you can quickly flex up um, at moments as they, they come up. That's incredibly helpful. And um, Caroline, another question from the audience for you is, you know, somebody said they would love to hear about, this is Michael, thank you, Michael, would love to hear about innovation and strategy for post-purchase customer touch points and how to think about that from a strategy perspective and also execution. Sure. Um, so for us thinking through um, the ways in which, from, Tierney talked about first party data. That's obviously, uh, our category has a lot of that. Um, so how we prioritize and utilize that and, um, you know, tying it to like the, the former question, I personally think about like media spend, at least within our category as more focused around lifetime value, looking at one individual customer and understanding how much it will cost to acquire them um, versus is kind of looking at it as a percent of revenue. Um, just because we have so much data, the way in which we're able to then segment it and prioritize who would be most efficient and deliver the highest return. That's kind of how we think about then in that post period, knowing which tiers are our highest, most valuable customers. That's where we're gonna kick into high gear in terms of 
ensuring all of those customers are enrolled in our loyalty programs. We're delivering um, not blanket um, offerings and utilizing more of what other retail companies are utilizing from like, you know, geofencing offers and, you know, more personalized in-app experiences. Um, so, you know, that's just to kind of tie those two together because we, nobody would have enough money to uh, market, you know, the millions and millions of customers within the, the grocery space. So it's truly about prioritizing and the same with all of your kind of post-purchase addressable channels, making sure those are relevant, um, not you aren't overly communicating, um, but you also have an eye on those lapsers because it's, you know, a high switcher category, lots of options out there. So it is, it is a fine balance, um, but focusing on your first party data and the foundational tools to make sure that everything is connected so that you have kind of that single view of a customer, that's going to be the most kind of innovative and efficient way from a foundational standpoint for all of those coach post-purchase communications, that whole journey, watching the whole journey, knowing what you said to them, if they responded, if they didn't, what you do, if they did, what is next? So it's, it's really, it's really fascinating. And you brought up an idea of loyalty and we continue to see a lot of questions about loyalty and right. How personalized, I mean, you know, my whole thing, right. The days of like buy five, get the six free. I, I think that we we've moved beyond that. And the customer, once again, if they, if they opt in so that they're comfortable sharing their data, but, but there's the idea that you can have a more personalized, localized, you know, relationship with the, the retailer that you're shopping and it, it doesn't matter what, what channel. Um, along those lines, Christina, you know, can you talk about what you're seeing in terms of brands, you know, and you work with big and small, what they're doing to, to keep new customers who first shop with them during the pandemic, you know, as things kind of return to, are we going this year of agility or, you know, we, we, we kind of get back out there in the way that we've, we've shopped in the past. Yeah, I think I'll answer that by double clicking on one of the words you just said, which is um, localization. I think it actually ties in very well um, with some of the things that Caroline was just saying. I think especially throughout the pandemic, consumers more than ever felt a desire to give back to their local communities, whether it was, you know, shopping with the small mom and pop, going into a store, feeling like the clerk actually knew who they were, fostering these real human connections. Um, and I don't see that going away. So I think what that means for the large brands and retailers is finding ways to deliver that you know, higher purpose to consumers. So thinking about whether you can bring in local inventory um, and think about your merchandising mix um, to bring in local suppliers, whether it is some of the, the strategies that Caroline was just talking about in terms of tailoring your message. So it feels like it isn't just, you know, um, Joe from headquarters picking you um, left and right with messaging that that doesn't even feel cohesive in any capacity. Um, it could also be things like, you know, shortening um, the last mile. So investing in things like micro fulfillment. I think a lot of retailers are thinking about the concept of localization in very different different ways um, and figuring out what's what's right for their brand to invest in. That's really helpful. So um, we have many audience questions and I apologize we didn't get to all of them. We're going to uh, leave uh, kind of our, our audience Q&A with a question from Brooke and then I have one question I want to ask everybody so it'll be quick. But um, Tierney, I'm going to put this one on you because I've actually been thinking about it uh, quite a bit. So Brooke asked, do consumers care about trends? Can we even predict trends for the next two years? And I have to say like my own personal and I've now had the conversation with about 20 people, right? This idea that, right, it's like the end of the skinny jean. I mean, when you tell me it's the end, I like them going out and buying like as many skinny jeans as I possibly can. And I know many of my friends are as well, because everyone's like, I finally figured out how to wear these. So, so th this idea, I mean, it's almost like the reverse, right? They're telling me that like the trend is over. So I'm, I'm then actually, you know, kind of buying more. I, I thought it was just a fascinating question because I, I do think about it quite a bit. And the fact that we've had some of these challenges around R&D, how does that kind of all come to play as we think about, you know, the rest of this year and going into next? Oh, I'm going to give you my best answer on this one. <laughs> um, I think the, I think, you know, right, we're in this time frame where um, I think everyone's trying to figure it out. I think consumers are trying to figure it out. Brands are trying to figure it out. Um, businesses have had to pivot so much. Um, and so I think, I always, I, I, you know, often um, believe that everything is cyclical. Um, and I think this, you know, is a time where we are seeing how much it is cyclical. We've been talking a lot about these concepts that we've localization, personalized messaging, last mile delivery. None of these are new 
concepts. None of these are new trends. Um, these have been things that businesses have been tackling, marketers have been tackling for years. Um, and so I think it's buy online, pick up in store, right? That's what everybody has been talking about the past year. And yet three years ago, we were talking about that. Four years ago, we were talking about it. Um, and so I don't think it's that all of a sudden there's these brand new trends or concepts. It's more, it's knowing very specifically for your business, which ones are going to move the needle. Um, and so, um, right, we can't do everything and be amazing at everything. Some people can, but most can't. Um, and so it's really picking what are the ones that are really going to move the needle in your business and then honing in on those and getting, creating agile kind of infrastructures around those um, initiatives, I think is how you, you get to success this year. I, I have to say you're so wise, right? That, you know, and I haven't, you know, outside of my mom, I haven't heard, right? You can't do everything, right? You might, you might want to. And, and I remember I was talking to the CIO of a fairly large retailer and, and he truly came to, to Corsair for help. He's like, I have a hundred things on my to-do list. I know they'll all have an impact and I don't know where to start. And there was just this like overwhelm, which believe me, I, I, I have, after the last 14 months, I think we all understand that overwhelming feeling. And, and I thought that that was so incredibly interesting. So I think you have, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're very kind of um, prescient in terms of how you think about that. So we're going to, one final question, and uh, I'd love, uh, I'll go in alphabetical order. So Caroline, I'm going to start with you. Um, where should we focus as we just think about the holiday season, right? Between now and the end of the year and, and what can, you know, what can we do to, you know, what does success look like and what can we do to have even more success? Sure. Um, so I'll speak to, to the grocery category specifically. I mean, we started this conversation off with where currently in and we're going to continue to be walking into a bunch of shortages so like honestly right now walking into the holiday season having everything that people need and not creating kind of these new experiences um, that resemble you know nobody having toilet paper and things like that um, for us it's ensuring that we've got kind of all of our foundational um, pieces in play and then of course like Continuing on, I know I keep talking about kind of the discovery piece, but um, people are and family are, are so much even more so excited to get together around the holiday season. How can businesses like ours make that even more meaningful, um, knowing that it's been you know over a year that these people have been able to get together? So we play an important role in that. I will say my my dream is right. I'm having people over for a dinner party, and it's like the click of a button. And then everything's ordered and put into my cart. And so I, I, I will say I've, I've thought about this and I have seen this in other geographies. So it's, it's a huge opportunity. And I know some of my friends, when they've built like their carts, right? They have like their taco cart and they have their like chicken cacciatore cart. And so what they've done is they've, they've done that around different meals. But I think it's, there's so much opportunity in the grocery sector. And I think, you know, you're just getting started in terms of, of what the opportunities lie ahead and, and how technology can support that. All right, Christina, you're, you're next in our uh, alphabetical order. What does success look like for you as you're talking to so many of these brands for holiday and, and what can they do to have even greater success? I think I'll focus on the capabilities component. Um, I think, you know, we've talked quite a bit about how a lot of these capabilities, whether it's curbside focus, et cetera, were rolled out super quickly, which was very impressive. But I would say, you know, keep your keep your foot on the gas pedal. Um, I think there's gonna be a temptation probably from the folks holding the purse strings that, hey, we've got this up and rolling, let's shift the investment elsewhere. Um, but I think those were rudimentary for a reason. Um, you know, I've heard from a lot of brands and retailers that those strategies, those capabilities are really just being held together with tape. Um, and so going back to management and recommending, hey, you know what, if we're going to do buy online, pick up in store, we shouldn't have the customer need to call us when they pull up, maybe bringing in geofencing, something like that to really continue to make the experience um, even more seamless for shoppers going forward. That's great. All right, Tierney, take us home. I think I'll bring it back to... Um, I think really focusing in on your data and how your data is driving, um, as Christina said, whether it's the the products that the you know productization of things that you've rolled out over the past year or your marketing, where you're spending your media dollars, making sure that you are putting data at the the center of decision making, um, and also around personalizing to customers. We have we there's enough data for us to start to personalize um, to customers, and I think that's super important. And I think I'll I'll leave it I'll leave everyone with a piece of data, right? The fact that we have 1.5 trillion right in excess savings, right? 
the consumer has a lot of dry powder to spend. And I, I don't even think that we, right, this idea around this year of agility, I think it's really critical. And I wanna thank January Digital. I mean, a lot of great work was done here and, and Caroline and Christina and Tierney, I mean, this, we just kind of scratched the surface, but I think that we got to some, some solutions and, and some practical applications of, of what we can all do. So thanks for joining and uh, everyone uh, have a wonderful Memorial Day weekend and uh, looking forward to an incredibly successful holiday season as well. Thank you so much.